Hello and welcome back this, to this installment of Zarathustra Summer where we're running over um, some parts of Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra and we're having a look at um, how Nietzsche in this book is trying to reevaluate the civilizing principle. In, by that I mean how do we identify ourselves and distinguish ourselves from others as being higher or more civilized, more human. Um, in this section, we're going to have a look at kind of the end of the prologue, which deals with the last man. And here we really get a um, kind of more detailed description of, of the last man and um, what he is. What makes, what makes a last man a last man? Right, so um, there's a few different themes we're going to play around with here. Uh, so Nietzsche will, um, in his attempt to shake up the townspeople, because in the previous sections we went through, Nietzsche goes from his kind of, or sorry, Zarathustra goes from his isolated spot on a mountain down to the town, down to the townspeople. And uh, he's trying to, um, I suppose, kind of shake them up, wake them up a little bit, maybe trigger them a little bit, as we would put in the in the modern uh, vernacular. And um, the the townspeople, you know, they're very arrogant and they're very dismissive of him. And they uh, Nietzsche came across, which we're going to get back into in a second, um, a tightrope walker who was walking along a tightrope and he, he, he fell and everyone just ignores him. Uh, they think Zarathustra is weird and crazy and they think the tightrope walker is just a, just a stupid guy who's just getting himself into trouble for no reason kind of thing. And um, so we're coming across Zarathustra's kind of tension with the townspeople. And the townspeople are very much um, last men type figures. Um, so I'll read a little bit from the dialogue he says um it is time for man to fix his goal it is time for man to plant the seed of his highest hope his soil is still rich enough for it but this soil will one day be poor and weak no longer will it will a high tree be able to grow from it alas the time is coming when man will no more shoot the arrow of his longing out over mankind and the string of his bow will have forgotten how to how to twang. I tell you, one must have chaos in one to give birth to a dancing star. I tell you, you still have chaos in you. So, um, Zarathustra's fear here is that like men have forgotten how to be how to overcome themselves, how to be more than themselves. They've lost this um, what we call it, kind of vertical. Um, what Peter Sloterdijk would call vertical tension, uh, you know, a, a sense of ourselves which is which is bound among sense of higherness, lowerness, and so on. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the townspeople and the last man don't have a kind of arrogant assumption that they are higher, but this is different to a kind of authentic desire to overcome and to be, be authentically higher. These, these are kind of two different things. Um, and Nietzsche is kind of trying to, on I think on one no, sorry, I keep saying Nietzsche. Zarathustra is trying to, well, it is Nietzsche, um, uh, he's trying to warn the the people that the, the loss of this of this desire to overcome, this willingness to overcome, is going to be pretty detrimental, and it's kind of going to kind of change the very nature, the very ontological and spiritual um, kind of kind of being of humans themselves like um it's almost a bit like you know what would happen if we uh, put microchips in people's brains and control them like humans are just different after that you know it's like what happens after humans go from um living in hunter-gathering communities to living in agricultural communities like we're kind of in, we're kind of like an intrinsically different after that there's something that's like a substantial historical 
um, change here, and not a change for the better either, um, which Nietzsche is trying to warn about. And the uh, uh, obviously the very Dion uh, Dionysian side to Nietzsche, which is like um, chaos. There's still chaos in you, and chaos is a good thing to Nietzsche because I think um, you know I think I know today chaos kind of seems this kind of uh, something which anarchists or someone who uh, it, 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 chaos has a very political um connotation today but i, I don't think nietzsche is talking in, in strictly in this kind of modern political sense chaos for him is i think the ability to kind of shake up our assumptions of who we are um we are civilized enlightened beings um we are higher than the barbarians and so on um Chaos means the, I think, the willingness to 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 allow these identifications and assumptions to be disturbed or ch or challenged, maybe not even destroyed necessarily, like like kind of nihilistically, but but challenged. Um. So, then he continues on and he says, "Behold, I shall show you the ultimate man," which is just the translation in this book is what what we normally what we normally call in popular kind of popular terms uh, the last man. Um, behold, I shall show you the, the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? Thus asks the ultimate man and blinks. The earth has become small and upon it hops the ultimate man who makes everything small. His race is an, is in an, sorry, his race is as inexterminable as a flea. The ultimate man lives longest. We have this. We have discovered happiness," says the last man, and blinks. So, uh, the last man is um, obviously a figure of arrogance, but he's also a figure of something who can't be exterminated, <laughs> which is interesting. He can't be destroyed, and I think this is because he's like he's sort of so bound in his own self-preservation. He's. Um, I'm. I'm. I'm reminded a little bit uh, in these passages of. Um, Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbits. And Hobbit is a word I think Tolkien got from the word habit, creatures of habit. And, you know, uh, they don't go beyond their little their little community. They don't kind of wonder what's beyond the horizon. Um, they don't venture out. And because of that, they often don't get into conflict. They don't get into risk. So so, so they, they, you know, they end up living longer. And at the end of Lord of the Rings, when Frodo and Sam return to the Shire, after this big crazy you know world historical events of of like you know the end of men and um they return to the shire and no one even knows what's happened it's just like nothing's happened there so um the 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 last man is someone who lives longest and i think again this is sort of nietzsche's anti-darwinian um side coming out he's anti-darwinian in the sense that darwin kind of and a Hobbes as well. I mean, like a lot of the kind of, I, I'm not sure when Darwin was, but like, you know, a lot of that kind of early modern period going up into, I think the Victorian period. Um, um, and, you know, it was, you have, you have a very kind of increasingly, you know, kind of rational scientific society. Um, theories of evolution based on, survival being what is the fittest thing um and nietzsche is obviously undermining that um self-preservation being the 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 absolute um kind of kind of hallmarker in hobbesian terms of of being civilized and rational i think that's being undermined here a lot as well um and i like the way he describes the last man as someone who said <laughs> we have discovered happiness says the last man, and blinks. And blinking, I thought, was funny because it reminded me of the NPC meme. You know, um, the last man, he seems to, you know, if someone says something and blinks, it's almost like they're kind of like an automaton. You know, uh, it's it's a very good, like, uh, kind of a literary description of, <laughs> of a kind of automaton. Which is why it reminds me of the NPC meme because you could just imagine these people like just repeating these mantras and then like blinking, you know, just like this is what uh, orange man bad blink, <laughs> you know. So, um, and again, I think the NPC meme is 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 relevant to Nietzsche's last man because you know 
So, for example, if we were looking at like ancient Romans or ancient Greeks and they were like, they were like civilized, but in this ancient sense, this very classical sense where, where they were in the middle of, you know, war, conflict, uh, building civilizations, exploring new lands, engaged in like very, very kind of, uh, how can you say, it? like imminently engaged in uh, politics and philosophical thought. Uh, on a day-to-day basis you're kind of in the middle of like your your struggle for excellence right um but once you know in the modern era when a lot of that's being done and it's being built and you're kind of just sitting in the in the rewards of it there's a lot of assumptions of your higherness but there's not a lot of like showing it there's not a lot of like being it uh struggling against something it's it's kind of just given to you and you're kind of just sitting in the middle of it and in this sense, your um, your exclusion from the struggle and from the kind of more imminent practice of excellence is, um, you know, you start to think of yourself um, as higher in a very arrogant and very assumed way. And the 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 uh, barbarians, the peasants, the kind of townspeople, not townspeople, the kind of um, goat herds as he often refers to kind of no longer become the people that are excluded from civilization necessarily but they they sort of become the people that are like at the height of civilization this this npc figure and you even have to think about like what the word npc refers to because it's very similar to last man so like last man means last it's like after all of the interesting things have happened after all of the the in historical terms, the kind of world historical struggles have been have been participated in by people living in history, um, in kind of in these kind of ethical terms of higherness and lowerness, um, the struggle for higherness and the participation in higherness, as opposed to kind of merely observing it or merely enjoying the rewards of those of that society, which which was imminently participating in it. So last man is kind of an, it, there's a kind of an exclusionary um, uh, connotation to it. And so is it with non-playing character, non-playing. You're not participating. You're not playing. You know what I mean? You're just a side, a side character, a piece of furniture. You're just <laughs> walking around like an automaton being programmed into saying certain things. Um, and this arrogance and this false assumption of higherness and, and this false assumption of being enlightened and civilized, um, as opposed to being excluded in the sense of like, oh, the barbarians, those Germanic and Celtic tribes up, up there living in, you know, they're, you know, like living like barbarians, you know, uh, they're not they're not in the polis. They're not civilized like us. There's like a different form of exclusion. It's not that form of exclusion. It's, it's not the ancient form of exclusion here of being outside the polis, being a barbarian. It's like an exclusion from within an exclusion from within um, through higherness or through through not higherness in, in the authentic sense, but higherness in the assumed sense, in the arrogant sense. Um, so he, he describes the last man a little bit more. So read it a little bit. Um, they have left places where living was hard, for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs oneself against him, for one needs warmth. Sickness and mistrust, which would kind of suggest you're only really together because you're kind of like animal. <laughs> it's very, yeah, again, it's very like dehumanizing language he's using um, in the sense that he's describing things which we see as like civilized, but then he's kind of going, it's kind of an animalistic tendency to that, but like a herdish and domesticated animal tendency, not the animal tendency of like a lion or like a wolf or like an eagle or like a, uh, a even even like a snake or something, which could kind of be also less uh, less prestigious. You know, a snake is normally something which is slithery and bleh. but like these sorts of these sorts of wild animal kind of um, rhetorical associations are never used for the last man. It's always a domesticated animal. Like you know, the sheep in in the in the livestock and in the farm kind of will sit together for warmth and so on. Um, sickness and mistrust count as sins with them. One should go about warily. He is a fool who still stumbles over over stones or over men. 
A little poison now and then, that produces pleasant dreams. A lot of poison at last for a pleasant death. They still work, for work is entertainment, but they take care not, the, sorry, they take care the entertainment does not exhaust them. Um, nobody grows rich or poor anymore. Both are too much of a burden. Who still wants to rule? Who obey? Both are too much of a burden. N uh, no herdsman and one herd. Everyone wants the same thing. Everyone is the same. Whoever thinks otherwise goes voluntarily into the madhouse. So, again, like this the kind of uh, complete mediocritizing of everything. Um, no one wants to live anywhere that is hard to live. People only get together for warmth as opposed to for, you know, higher engagements, you know, like the ancient Greeks did in, 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 the, um, in, the, in the Agora, you know, uh, getting together to discuss these um, questions of beauty and justice and so on. Or in the phalanx, you know, in the in the getting together for the sake of war, conquest, uh, getting into a in, getting into a boat to sail the seventies. These sorts of getting togethers, which have like you know these kind of classical hiredness to them, this is very much replaced here in, with the last man, with a kind of with a kind of getting together for kind of vulgar domestic reasons, like warmth or entertainment or mere entertainment. Is what I should say. Um, so. Uh, and, you know, work, like they work because they're entertained, but they, they try hard not to exhaust themselves because they wouldn't want to work too hard on anything. Um, nobody wants to rule. Nobody wants to obey. Nobody wants to be rich. No one wants to be poor. Everything's in this middle ground, right? Um, and then he says, no herdsman and one herd. So no leader and just a kind of almost almost self-moving, again, very, very much NPC, like a kind of self-moving, uh, as Paul Virilio would say, as I'm always quoting, emotionally synchronized kind of horde just kind of floats around and it's like, who's leading this? Who's following? There is no leaders. There is no followers. It's just, how is this happening? It's this kind of spontaneous mediocrity just moving around, right? Um, so everything's been made smaller. Everything's been made more mediocre and so on. And anyone who any and anyone who says otherwise voluntarily puts themselves into the madhouse. Um, which is a very Foucauldian thing to say. Um, he said, he's, I'll, I'll keep reading. Formerly, all the world was mad, say the most acute of them, and blink. They are clever and know everything that has ever happened. <laughs> that's fantastic. They're clever and know everything that's ever happened. And I think this is a dig at um, the, the, you know, kind of the collection of knowledge, of kind of the collection of historical facts and scientific data which modern societies and you know Nietzsche Victorian era his, his society was um kind of excelling at you know um this the, <laughs> this leads to a sort of arrogance that leads to a sort of assumption that we have more facts and historical data and and and, and scientific data and empirical blah, blah, blah. This, this somehow means anything you know it doesn't really um uh, we're very clever and we know everything that ever happened. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Fukuyama, um, who talks a lot about the last man in the end of history in the last man, obviously, the very last section, which is by far the best um, part of that book. And you don't need to believe anything else in the book to, to read that section, the last man. You can, you can, like, it's the most critical of liberalism. It's very critical of liberalism, that section. And he refers to Nietzsche a lot in that section. And you can see why. And um, Fukuyama, he also talks about one of the problems of liberalism is, is it's, it's actually, it's not its failures, but it, it's, it's, its actual success is in a sense a failure, or it could be a failure um, if it doesn't give people enough engagement, if, every, if everyone becomes too kind of arrogant and self-satisfied and it becomes very nihilistic. Um, and... In one part, he says something, something like, um, "The last man uh, pats himself on the back for not being, for you know, looking at these history books and saying, look at all these silly Catholics and Protestants fighting each other. Look at all these silly Germans and French fighting each other. Look at all these silly Christians and Muslims fighting each other. They're all such. They're all so stupid. Aren't I so clever? Because I because I because I because I don't participate in anything. Because I." Because I know better. I know better, you know. So, um, 
yeah like that's a interesting um correlation there anyway i'll keep going um they still quarrel but they soon make up otherwise indigestion would result <laughs> they have they have their little pleasure for the day and their little pleasure for the night but they respect health we have discovered happiness says the last man 